Ah, kia ora koutou. He nui ngā mihi ki a koutou, tēnei wā. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, act as a discussant. I, just an apologia to begin with. Um, while I have a developmental psychological background, I'm trained as a developmental psychologist, my work is mostly in education and educational context, so I'm going to invite you to try and make the transfers and generalizations from the things I know to, to what we've just been talking about. I will try to make them, but I won't be able to make them as much as you. Uh, I've got some general comments, maybe three, to try and stimulate uh, further discussion, and then some specific com comments around uh, each of the presentations. Um, I understand this is an Australasian conference, so here's my one Aussie joke, uh, if you'll bear with me. So we're going to be talking about super roo, aren't we? Okay, that's it. It, it, it doesn't get any better than that, believe me. Um, all right, Superu. Here's a comment about um, the nature of uh, Superu, what you've been, what you've been hearing. Uh, this is a unique opportunity in, in New Zealand. The agency itself creates a unique opportunity. Uh, what Richie and I and the others um, have learned recently is something you probably know very well. Uh, and that is, for some target groups, for some... Uh, areas of vulnerability for some places where we have better public service goals there are multiple agencies doing multiple things for the same kids you know um, in the budget bid round this year for, for the New Zealand um, budget the social sector bids uh, we did a quick count uh, in fact one of the one of the proposals had done part of the count for us of all those programs that might be focused on uh, kids graduating from high school. Now our graduation in New Zealand is sort of uh, NCEA level two. Australians, you don't really need to know what that means, but that's, that's the sort of graduating level. There are something like 72 odd different programs across justice, education, health, MSD, that are focused on, in one way or another, that outcome. That is higher achievement levels for kids who might be at risk at NCEA, and none of us None of us know how individually, let alone collectively, any of those programs operate. What are the, what's their collective impact? What's their singular in, impact? Now, uh, Subaru is in, a, is in a sense mandated to help us create that coherence. There's a really important opportunity for us here um, to take the work that Subaru is, uh, is developing, as you've seen, the illustrative um, programs, and help New Zealand. I don't know if there's an equivalent in Australia. I have no idea, but we certainly need it. Uh, second comment, um, it came out in two or three of the programs. Uh, it's an issue that faces me in education always, and it's the issue of uh, program fidelity. It's around the nature of evidence, of course, uh, or treatment integrity. Now, I've come to the conclusion that this is a, uh, <clears throat> this is a really, this is problematic in education. That is, uh, variability is common uh, across programs in education, and I presume in the sorts of programs we're talking about here, parenting programs and others. That is to say, different, um, different, given the same program implemented, different levels of implementation and different outcomes. You've got variability in both, in both those senses. And I want to say that's actually natural in a peculiar sense of natural. And the usual response is to say, well, if we've got the variability, we've just got to, we've just got to tighten up the prescriptive part of our program. You know, we've got to make people do what it is the program is designed to do. Well, in the context of education, that's in tension, in tension with, with what we want um, uh, our teachers to be able to do. That is to be able to make choices, be flexible, be adaptive in the way that they teach their kids. It's true, actually, even the, the most prescriptive program we've got in education, which is reading recovery. You know, teachers need to be able to take a program, as it, as it were, and adapt it to local circumstance, to say nothing of adapting it to, to the local child, if, if the child is the focus. So program treatment integrity is often in tension with that, and it's, and it's, it's an intention also with something, again, that we've realized in New Zealand at a systemic level is we have to be building capability in schools rather than 
are, as it were, designing better programs that work. I, I could elaborate on that, but may, I, I, maybe I'll just offer that as a point of discussion. Uh, the third general con comment, picking up on Richie's point, points made here, it's about early intervention. Clearly early intervention, I'd agree, I would imagine all of you agree with Richie's point. There is a slight problem with early intervention. A slight problem in education goes like this, but Richie gave you some examples too, is that even despite the early intervention and the best early interventions we can design, there are still, perhaps you might like to consider these as structurally imposed developmental sensitivity, sensitive points. For example, despite backgrounds of kids coming into secondary school, the lead up to and the engagement with our high stakes exams creates new developmental pressures. Now just because we've got an early intervention program at year one that picks kids up and they're able to decode fluently and read some simple stuff with comprehension is not going to get them necessarily as a necessary outcome, sorry, as a sufficient outcome to perform adequately uh, in, in biology or physics. Uh, uh, at the top end of secondary. In other words, we need multiple interventions. We need multiple way we need to think about a developmental coherence rather than early intervention will solve. That, that's my way of looking at it, and I, I invite you to think about whether or not there are parallels in your work. All right, Jeremy talked about um, parenting programs. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of points about outcome measures and um, uh, and the nature of evidence. Uh, and, and again, I just offer these to you as, as points of discussion. Um, there was reference, and this might, again for the Australian audience, uh, reference to the BPSs. I presume that's how you pluralise BPS. Right, these are the better public service goals. Now we have a certain series of better, better public service goals in education. I know these very well. 98% um, participation of, of kids in early childhood education before they get to school. That's a public service goal. We're around about 95.8% at the moment. There are differentials between uh, uh, Māori and Pacifica kids and, um, and non-Māori and non-Pacifica kids. But we're tracking upwards, we'll get there. We've got one around the graduation from, from school. Uh, the, the, the measure I referred to previously is NCEA. We've got a BPS target around that. These are really important outcome measures systemically. However, and I, Jeremy, I don't know if this is true in, in your field and, and the way you presented it, but there are unintended consequences of those BPS targets. They're good systemically, good drivers to, to, to move a system towards having a joint coherent focus on, on change, but they do, they do carry risks. Uh, case in point, the, um, uh, the BPS target around graduating from high school uh, means, you know, we need to have 85% of 18-year-olds uh, with, with the graduation certificate. That's called NCEA2. Well, guess what? The schools functioning with that lever work really hard to get all their kids through NCA Level 2, irrespective of the quality of the trajectory. Um, this is serious. You know, you know, there is something around 11% of Māori and Pacifica kids doing science standards in year 13. Now, rather than blame the school, blame the lever. Blame, blame the BPS target. The schools are just operating and functioning under the target. Now, I don't know if that applies to the other BPS targets, the ones that are most important to your fields, but I invite you to think about the unintended risks associated with uh, systemic targets. Jeremy, the... the um, I really like Jeremy's question, um, the nature, uh, the, which is what works for whom and under what conditions and at scale. Uh, I really like the question because it's a question I, I use often now and I try to think about the answers to. Uh, the reason for that being is not just about what works. It's not just about uh, uh, what program has what sorts of effects uh, um, on uh, an average outcome. It's about knowing the variability. It's about knowing 
who, who it works for, under what set of conditions, as Jeremy said. So it's a really, really good question. But one other point about the evidence. Um, <clears throat> And it, it, it comes up again, actually, in, in Katie's paper uh, around resilience. So maybe I'll just leap to Katie's paper and then make the connection. Katie talked about um, resilience. And I think the concept of resilience is really important, obviously, because it shifts the notion of deficit to one of uh, you know, well, resilience and making a difference over time. But the the move from that deficit theorizing is really important in the context of, of what uh, both Jeremy and, and Katie referred to as uh, the population-based, you know, the prediction risk modeling. You know, most of that discourse, those of you who have been listening to the radio and, and are in contexts where the modeling is being done, is around forward liability. You know, It's, it, it's around what is our investment um, how is our investment being wasted, if you like? And I reckon the question should much be much more built around forward benefit. And it seems to me the concept of resilience gives us a way of thinking about the forward benefit of our interventions and our programs, rather than this thing about how much are we saving the state. Um, the other point about uh, Katie's uh, um, uh, paper on resilience, it does avoid this deficit theorizing, but the, the underlying risk of anything we do in education, again, I invite you to think about the connection with your work, uh, is something that we call Matthew effects. Now, the Matthew effects uh, are the effects where um, the rich get richer and poor get poorer. Translated into an educational context. The kids who have a lot of knowledge or skills, if you like, uh, cultural capital in a certain area, tend to get more out of education than kids who don't. And not only do they get more out of it, they tend to get more and more out of it, and the gap between the haves and the have-nots uh, widens. So the, the risk in all our programs in education is that unless we target really, really well, we may be providing yet more fuel uh, to fuel the differences between groups of kids. It's just, it, it occurred to me thinking about the, um, the concept of resilience and how maybe the, the families that are more resilient might get even more resourcing because they're resilient. You know, it's, it's just just a potential, I call it in education, a double whammy from the way in which we uh, identify our kids. And Zoe's paper on prison, um, her, her paper illustrates a really, a really interesting uh, uh, tension, again, in our translation of research into practice, uh, research into policy. It's um, the question of what parts of the evidence from other jurisdictions might apply here. Now, I, I just leave that as a question. You know, in, in, in Richie, Richie's point about how much funding we don't have, you know, the limitations on our funding to do things, and how we're therefore reliant on as much evidence as we can gather, and the risk here, of course, in inappropriately generalizing from evidence uh, that may not have been collected in our jurisdictions to our jurisdictions when they don't apply. Uh, case in point, perhaps. The New Zealand does very well uh, in educational circles and international comparisons. We're a high quality system, but we're also a low equity system, educationally speaking. Uh, and we curiously have one of the largest impacts of SES in the OECD data on uh, educational achievement. It's a very large effect. Why would it be larger in New Zealand than, for example, Canada or Australia? And the reason for that is because there is a very powerful interaction, of course, between cultural identity and SES. Unless you understand the interaction between those two things, you don't understand uh, the effect of SES, if you like, or what sits behind SES on, on our programs and our program outcomes. So taking a program elsewhere that might be directed at SES would not necessarily get to the point about the interaction between SES and, uh, and cultural identity. And I really like Zoe's question that she ended up with, which was, um, what don't we know? We don't often ask that question. We're often after the syntheses and the, 
the meta-analyses and the things like that rather than saying, you know, where are the real gaps, things that we really don't know. The last paper, um, Kim's paper, illustrates my point that I started with, which is about the cross-agency coherence. I mean, all those, thank you, all those, um, all those agencies listed on the first or second slide, Superu is just well positioned to try and make sense of that incredible complexity. Um, and to make the obvious point about um, what sorts of coherence we're talking about, oh, let me just say, it's not just about, as, as, uh, as Kim said, where are the gaps, it's about where are the overlaps. You know, we, we, we've got, as I said, you know, multiple programs trying to do the same thing with kids, and there's, there are huge overlaps here, and hence, and I will adopt the investment and speak for a moment, hence, presumably, a lot of waste of money. Presumably. You know, I, there are schools out there that suffer exactly the same problem. Multiple, multiple programs. I know one uh, low decile uh, high school uh, with whom my research center works that has something like four different programs aimed at um, higher achievement in science in the upper, upper secondary school. The levers on the principal are because she needs to get as much funding as possible. She just grabs whatever's there. But we don't know, she doesn't know, which of those are actually impacting on kids' achievement through science. All right. So, <clears throat> to sum up, stop, because I'm now down to one minute. Now I'm down to 30 seconds. That's my last offer. <laughs> Okay. All right. I'll stop uh, by saying thank you for listening. <laughs>